Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth day of NAMI's AI Winter School. I'm John Martin. I'm a postdoc at the University of Alberta. And today I'm really excited to be giving you all uh, your first glimpse at reinforcement learning. As you may have heard, reinforcement learning is a really active area of computer science research these days, although it also sits at the intersection of lots of other fields of study. Um, so although I regret I can't be there to speak with you all in person, I still think that you're going to like the content that we have lined up for you today. Uh, me and the other speakers have put together uh, some really excellent and high quality material, which I think you'll enjoy. Um, so let's get started. So let's start off with this hypothetical. For a moment, let's pretend that we're this rat or we're another small animal that we like a little bit more and that we're placed at the start of this maze. Now, our task, as we've been uh, told, is to navigate to the end of the maze, to, uh, to this goal. And when we get there, we'll be rewarded with a little bit of cheese. Um, now, if we've seen this maze before, if we know what the maze is like, then this problem's really straightforward, right? Because all we have to do is we just have to follow the a priori known path all the way to the goal. It might take a little bit of time, but we'll eventually get there and we'll get the cheese and we'll be happy. Um, now things get a little more interesting when we don't know what the maze is like. So what do we do in that case? Well, we're going to have to do a little bit of exploration. You know, we'll probably take some turns that lead us to dead ends. I mean, we can already see that right here that the rat is in a place that it's going to have to back itself out of. Um, that one wasn't too bad, you know, but some some mistakes might be more consequential than others. For instance, we wouldn't know that we've hit a dead end um, if we've taken this corridor right here until we get all the way over here and actually see that it's a dead end. And here's another example. We won't even know that we've that this whole section of the maze is useless until we've explored this corridor and found that dead end and explored this corridor and found that dead end, right? So there is a sense in which like our actions have consequences that we won't be able to experience immediately. Um, but you know, as we explore more, we'll eventually stumble upon the goal. Uh, and then when we do, you know, we'll be happy because we got the cheese. And we'll also be better off for it because the next time we encounter this maze, we'll have some prior experience to leverage, right? We'll be able to take that knowledge, lean on it a little bit and navigate to the cheese a little bit faster than we did last time. Um, so this whole scenario in essence is kind of how reinforcement learning works. And it's sort of what it's about, right? Because reinforcement learning is all about making good decisions uh, in an a priori unknown environment. And it's about doing that through a trial and error interaction process. Um, so here's a preview of what we're going to go through today and what you'll experience. Uh, in this first lecture, which I'm giving, we're going to be covering uh, what RL is all about, you know, and where does it sit in relation to other fields of study and other kinds of machine learning that we've heard about. We're gonna dig in a little bit more once we do that into the concepts of reinforcement learning. We're gonna put all that together to uh, form a reinforcement learning system. Uh, that's going to be you know, the piece that we use to solve the reinforcement learning problem. <laughs> now, when we have all that, uh, you'll have the sufficient basis needed to tackle these other lectures, um, such as going into the essential algorithms of reinforcement learning. And this is really when things get interesting because you'll be introduced to algorithms such as Q-learning and SARSA and things of that nature. And then in lecture three, we're going to expand the scope of, of those algorithms. And we're going to scale them up to large scale function approximators involving deep neural networks um, that'll help us tackle really high dimensional observations and you know, large scale problems. And then in the fourth lecture, uh, this is going to be really neat as well. There, we're going to spotlight a couple different areas where RL has been applied successfully, um, areas such as robotics and the physical sciences. So our goal is that when you're done today, when you're done watching all these lectures, you will be sufficiently prepared to um, tackle an RL research paper. And maybe you'll even have the courage to start up your own RL research project. And in addition to all of the lectures today, there's also going to be a practical assignment. And this is when your hands are going to get dirty. Uh, we're going to have you coding up in Python um, a few of these important RL concepts and observing uh, some important phenomena, how all those pieces fit together. Um, you'll be also implementing some important reinforcement learning algorithms. 
in a small scale domain and even in a larger scale domain involving uh, some deep neural networks. This assignment is based in Google Colab, which is just a Python notebook. I think uh, some of the other courses are using this format as well. Um, however, uh, this assignment is only going to be released after this lecture. It's going to be available through this GitHub repository, which will be made public um, right at the end of this. So keep an eye out for that. Now, if you're a person that likes to have a textbook with you um, and have something to read along with, then this is the book to use. All of the lectures you're going to see today have tried to adopt the notation that's used in this book by Rich Sutton, uh, the gentleman on the left, and Andy Barto, who's the gentleman on the right. Um, I'll have to say that it, this is just a good textbook. It's, a, it's one of the most common entry points into the subject matter that I find. Um, I started reading it when I didn't know anything about reinforcement learning, um, and many of my peers did as well. And it's kind of nice in that sense because folks that I've collaborated with that know the textbook really well kind of have their own language and they can talk to each other and make references through different chapters. Um, and I think that's kind of neat. Um, but in any case, one of the other nice things about this textbook, besides it being really accessible and uh, well written for the introductory audience, is that it's uh, openly accessible. It's freely available online. You can find it by just following this link right here. This will link you to Rich's website. Um, and you can also find other various copies online if you just Google them. Um, this is a very easy to find book. Now, if you're like me and you know one, one textbook isn't enough, you need to, to cross-reference all your ideas from different textbooks and try and see the same idea from different angles, then you will want to look at the last slide of this presentation um, where we've compiled, me and the other speakers, we've compiled a list of um, other high quality resources, including textbooks and including links to other courses that you can, you can go to and watch. Um, so in a, this will be at, in a few places actually, it'll be at the end of this presentation and it's going to be at the end of the practical assignment and I'll make sure to put it in the Discord server as well. One of the most fascinating things that I find with reinforcement learning is the way that it makes contact with so many other fields of study. This image does an excellent job illustrating that. I sourced this from David Silver's introduction to reinforcement learning lecture, which we provide a link to in, in our course too. Um, but as computer scientists, I think we're, we're inclined to believe uh, reinforcement learning is only a type of machine learning and that's where it ends but you know the reality is uh, the concepts and the questions that it hopes to answer you know are much broader and they touch all these different areas um, one over uh, interesting area of overlap is in engineering in the branch of optimal control and that branch of study um, the goal is to try and find a sequence of actions that can control some dynamic system the system in, the, in those cases is typically known in advance, whereas in reinforcement learning, it's unknown. Um, however, there's a lot of overlap there because the terminology used and even like the mathematical formalism of some of the uh, objectives is, are the same. And in mathematics, the branch that studies optimal decision-making uh, is known as operations research. Um, some problems from that field might include uh, like shortest path problems and network routing, and inventory control and machine repair scheduling and things of that nature. And optimal decision-making overlaps with economics, of course, because those folks are interested in trying to figure out when individuals or when large groups of individuals uh, will make decisions. And, um, the big assumption in under the bounded rationality branch of economics is that you know, humans make decisions that are, I guess, that maximize their utility, right? Um, so when do they do that and how can they do that? <clears throat> and the idea of, uh, of acquiring knowledge and correcting errors through uh, trial and error, through this process of reinforcement, um, all that language was really articulated in the behaviorist movement, movement in psychology. Folks like 
B.F. Skinner and uh, John Watson and Ivan Pavlov. Um, they articulated a lot of that language within the classical and operant conditioning um, field of study. And finally, in neuroscience, um, one of the one of the most exciting discoveries recently, within like the 1980s and the 1990s, within neuroscience, um, has been that uh, parts of the mammalian brain can be explained by reinforcement learning algorithms. One that we're actually going to get to study in the next lecture. In particular, it's the activity of the dopamine neuron um, has strong parallels to one of the algorithms we'll study. In recent research within neuroscience, folks have been trying to apply concepts from reinforcement learning um, to explain how knowledge could potentially be represented in applications or in uh, tasks of spatial navigation. Um, so, the point of all of this really is, is that reinforcement learning isn't just a type of machine learning. It's really like a broad set of questions. And uh, the concepts that are within reinforcement learning are quite broad as well and quite powerful. Now let's zoom in a bit on that machine learning bit. Um, let's compare uh, reinforcement learning to the other paradigms of machine learning. And I think by doing this, we'll gain a better understanding of what reinforcement learning is. So I'm going to be comparing it against these four different attributes here. Um, what kind of learning is going on here? Are there delayed consequences that uh, the learning system can experience? We saw a little bit of this in the maze example, where uh, the mouse could, uh, could navigate down a corridor and it wouldn't know that that was a bad decision until it reached a dead end sometime later. Um, is there a need for exploration? And some learning problems, no, there's no need for exploration. <clears throat> knowledge derives from. So where is the knowledge coming from uh, that's being acquired? I'm going to start off by focusing on planning, as it's done in artificial intelligence. Planning typically starts with a system, a computing system, that takes in a model of the way the world works, and it'll apply some systematic search procedure to that. And by doing so, it's really just trying to extract some information that's already in the model. Um, so there's no learning that's being done there. However, depending on how the search is carried out, uh, there could be delayed consequences. Uh, you could search that maze, even if I gave you the map of the maze to start with, you can search it in a way that could be less efficient in some ways and more efficient in other ways. Um, however, there's no need for exploration there because there's no new knowledge being uncovered. It's just a matter of trying to figure out what you already know. <laughs> um, and all of the knowledge that we derive in the context of planning comes from the model. In supervised learning, uh, we're given a data set of labels, of inputs and outputs. And we're asked to select from among a family of functions, typically, the one that fits the data set best. Um, so in this case, uh, I would call the mode, of reflect, uh, the mode of learning reflected because we're taking historical data, something that has already happened, and we're trying to pull something out of it. Um, there's no delayed consequences that can occur here because learning happens, I would say, once. Uh, you select your family from among your family of functions, uh, some element that fits the data set best, and you return that, and then you're done. Uh, there's also no need for exploration. An example of this might be um, trying to predict the amount of rainfall uh, from a bunch of historical data that might include, say, pressure or um, temperature and things of that nature. In unsupervised learning, it's much, it's much the same story. Um, there's no delayed consequences. There's no need for exploration. Uh, all of your knowledge is being derived from the data set. However, the data set is structured differently. There's no labels there. Uh, and the objective is a bit different. The objective is to try and extract some sort of structure or impose some sort of structure onto the data. Um, everything, though, is still done in a reflective manner because we're operating on a fixed data set. One example might be to try and find the dominant shapes of Nepali desserts from all of your, from like a fixed set of experiences with Nepali desserts. Um, for me, I have very limited 
experience with Nepali desserts. So I might conclude that since all I've had is sale, uh, the dominant shape of Nepali desserts is circular. In reinforcement learning, uh, it's a very different story because the mode of learning here is experiential. There is a learning system and it's interacting with an environment. And because of that, um, there's a need for exploration. It doesn't know how the environment works. So it needs to uh, make some decisions so that it can gather knowledge. And then once it gathers that knowledge, then it can decide whether it wants to continue exploring or whether it wants to exploit what it knows to um, try and make good decisions. There's this notion of delayed consequences that again, we saw in the maze example, where you can take an action that um, has unintended effects that you won't find out about until later. Uh, all of the knowledge in reinforcement learning is deriving from a single data stream. It's a data stream of you uh, taking actions and observing the consequences of those actions. Um, and this is an experiential process. So this would be, uh, this would be like if I asked you to navigate from Kathmandu to Janakpur um, without a map. What you would need to do is you would need to, uh, you would need to drive a bunch of places to, and try and create the map as you go um, to navigate the map. Right, now let's take a look at a few use cases so that we can get a better sense of how reinforcement learning um, has been applied. Our first example comes from the world of robotics. What we're looking at here is a stratospheric air balloon whose purpose is to float high up into the atmosphere and to provide internet connectivity to regions down below. Um, and these are typically remote regions that are difficult to access and establish conventional uh, internet infrastructure. And this is a particularly challenging problem uh, for classical control techniques because uh, for one, this system is underactuated. It can only ascend and descend. Um, so if it wants to traverse a lateral plane, then it has to ascend and essentially ride a thermal current over to its desired position and descend and ascend um, in order to regulate that position. Uh, so what the authors of this 2020 Nature paper were able to show was that by incorporating real experience of um, flying in these really difficult to model wind conditions and controlling this really difficult to control uh, balloon that they were able to more effectively regulate their position uh, in a desired area uh, to provide better inter internet connectivity than like a standard control technique would. This example comes from the world of um, education. So reinforcement learning is a very powerful idea in that it can apply not just to controlling dynamic systems in the optimal control sense, but we can apply it to other maybe less uh, conventional uh, forms of adaptation too. Um, so in this example, this comes out of uh, Emma Brunskill's group. Emma Brunskill is a professor at Stanford University. Um, she showed that, she that, um, that they were able to adapt certain elements of this program to enrich a user's experience. And that by adapting these elements uh, using the principles of reinforcement learning, they could improve user engagement and they, can, they could improve uh, course completion to a significant degree over just a standard static program. Um, in 2015, uh, there is a group of researchers at DeepMind that kind of dazzled the world by uh, showing them, showing us these results of a reinforcement learning system uh, beating humans in Atari. Um, this, what we're looking at here is a screen from the game Breakout in Atari. Uh, the point is to control this puck left and right and essentially bounce a little rock or another puck uh, off of these walls in order to chip away at this large block here. And each time you do, you get points. And the point of the game is to chip it all away um, and make sure that the puck never goes past this line here. Otherwise, it's a game over. But in any case, uh, what uh, this group was able to show is that they could uh, essentially take experience from Atari 
and learn how to play Atari better than humans across an entire suite of these games. There's about uh, 50 or 60 in total. And for the most part, they were able to beat humans in all of them. Um, and this was particularly significant just because of the way they did it. Um, this was one of the first instances where a reinforcement learning system could use the same visual inputs as a human. What we're looking at is the pixels um, and you know, the video game screen. And they were able to you know, beat humans performance uh, kind of on a level playing field. And in a similar vein, AI is like a law has a long history of uh, trying to benchmark itself against like very difficult games. And the game of Go is no different there. For many years, uh, the game of Go is thought to be kind of uncrackable by computers just because it's it has like such a large space of possible moves that you can imagine. And um, what another group of researchers did at DeepMind is they were able to show that uh, similar principles that were applied in DQN, in addition to some uh, search techniques, uh, that they were able to be applied to play the game of Go very effectively. And in this 2017 documentary, um, they kind of cover the whole uh, saga of that and trying to play against one of the grandmasters that has spent years of his life uh, learning this game, Lisa Dole. Uh, so I encourage you to check out that movie if you're interested. In 2019, there were really impressive results that um, were published by OpenAI showing how a robotic hand could not only learn how to manipulate a Rubik's Cube, but also solve it simultaneously. All of this was done using the principles of reinforcement learning. And I believe that in the applications lecture, we're going to spotlight this, this particular project. So we can imagine reinforcement learning as this interaction between a learning system or an agent, as people like to call it, and an environment. Um, here I'm representing the environment as the globe, the earth, and the learning system as this robot. At some point in time, T, um, the learning system is going to take an action, AT. And this is based on the information that's provided in its observations at that same time step, OT. The action is going to cause the state of the world to change from ST to a new state, ST plus one. Right? And then at the same time, the environment will emit uh, another set of observations. These are This is information that the learning system can actually observe and um, it's essentially the inputs to the system and a reward, RT plus one. And it's the learning system's objective to adjust its actions, to take actions such that it gets an increasing amount of reward in the future. So as we can see, one of the most fundamental concepts in reinforcement learning is this idea of the reward. What is a reward? Well, uh, Mathematically, the reward is just a number. It's a scalar feedback signal that reflects the instantaneous utility of a single transition from state ST to ST plus one. Um, this information comes entirely from the environment, so the learning system gets to observe it, but it doesn't get to control it per se, only in, or say design it, but it does get to control the data stream uh, through its actions so that it gets more of it. Um, so we see these bears here, and their goal in life might be to survive, uh, like most of us, right? But the way that they would assign credit to their actions and figure out whether it was a good idea to go to the water that day is through this idea of reward. Um, and maybe the reward here could be the fish. If they catch a fish, then it was a good idea to go to the water that day. And they'll know. And in the future, maybe they'll go back to that same spot. Um, and these kinds of bears will live longer than those that if you don't pay attention to that information or assign credit in a different way. Let's look at some examples. So in the stratospheric balloon example, what we were trying to do is maintain a certain uh, locality within a region of space so that we could provide connectivity. Um, so we can imagine a reward signal there would uh, give a bonus every time 
the balloon was within the desired region that it needed to provide good connectivity for, and it would penalize it for every time step it deviated from that region. And so what this would do in effect is it would encourage the learning system to take actions that you know, minimize the amount of time it was outside of that uh, desired region and maximize the actions that it took to maintain its position and regulate position within the desired region. For a game playing uh, learning system, the game score is a natural uh, reward to use there. Let's play the game so that we get the highest score. Um, for an animal uh, that's, we're trying to imagine what decisions they would make uh, for certain goals. Uh, perhaps the release of dopamine or other chemical substances in the brain is a reward signal there. So the reinforcement learning objective as it stands is to take actions that maximize the totality of future reward. The learning system wants to take an action at time t that will get it the most reward possible in the future. And this idea of future reward can be summarized with the variable, the return. Here I'm defining it to be gt, to be the return at time t. And it's just the sum of all the rewards that come after time step t, or t plus one, or t plus two, or t plus three, and so on. Now, there are some mathematical details here to consider, like such as what happens when um, that horizon goes to infinity. That's something I'll discuss later. But for the time being, the concept remains the same. It's still representing the, um, the totality of future reward. And it's because we're representing signals at multiple different time steps. And when they were, we're kind of trunk or accumulating them all into a single variable, that reinforcement learning can capture the temporal effects of delayed credit and about uh, multiple time steps. So what are observations? Um, I mentioned that the learning system takes in observations. Um, so what exactly are these? Well, mathematically, these can be vectors. Uh, and again, it's just the input that the learning system experiences. This can be something like coming from a sensory system of a robot. Um, in general, at least informationally speaking, uh, the observations are some set of variables that carry information about the environment state. And it gives the learning system uh, some information with which to um, extract patterns and use for decision making. Some examples of this within the autonom autonomous navigation problem would be the altitude sensor. How high is it above the ground? Uh, it's inertial sensors and GPS. Um, for the game bot, it would be the pixels on the screen. This is the only thing that would be fed into the learning system. And just using those pixels alone, it would need to learn how to play this video game. Uh, for an animal, it could be all the tactile information from its sensory systems. like. Uh, so the whiskers, uh, the tactile information coming back from the hands, uh, the things it sees and the things it smells. And environment state can be a really complex object to think about in general, because it really is the, it's the representation that's used to generate the next environment state, really forward simulate the world and to generate the observation and reward process. And depending on how complicated your environment is, that can be incredibly complex. Um, just look at this image here. This is at a location in Nepal. And if one wanted to forward simulate this entire situation, it would require an enormous amount of variables, right? Um, so in general, the learner really doesn't have access to the entire state, but it does get to observe something that reflects the true internal state. Some examples of environment state in the, in the autonomous navigation problem, again, would be a full physical account of the phenomena that really drives the motion of the balloon. And in the game bot, it might be the stack that's executing the program or you know, the binary strings uh, within the computer ring. Um, and for an animal, this could be a complete description of its nervous system and its surrounding world, similar to the navigation problem, all of the physical phenomena that are relevant for that particular problem. 
So in general, learning systems, they try and maintain their own form of state. And this is what we call agent state. Um, so this is the internal representation of environment state. This is reflecting patterns that the agent gets in its observation stream. Um, and this is the information that the learning system uses to make decisions. Let's think of some examples again. In the autonomous navigation problem, uh, agent state could be the output of our aircraft sensors versus the reality of, of, the, of the world, right? The reality that's driving the motion of the, um, of the aircraft. For a game bot, it could be the output of a convolutional neural network um, versus the actual stack that's executing the, the program. Um, in the animal case, uh, the agent state could be the totality of the nervous system activation patterns, like all the activations that are firing in the, in the central nervous system of the animal. You know, that's, what's, that's what it can use to make decisions. Um, and the environment state there would just be, again, a total description of reality. So now that we have a better handle on those concepts, let's move forward and try and put these pieces together um, to see how reinforcement learning problem can be solved. All right, well, now that we have a good handle on the concepts, let's uh, put the pieces together and assemble a more complete picture of what the reinforcement learning problem is. Mathematically, reinforcement learning is described as a Markov decision process. And we can define this with a tuple that contains a set of states that I'm denoting with the calligraphic S, a set of actions um, denoted with the calligraphic A, a probability distribution, P. This is called the transition distribution. And this places probability mass on rewards and successor states that follow from the starting state S and A. So if I take action A and state S, what is the probability that I'll end up in S prime and get the reward R? That's what the transition probability is describing. And in problems where the return goes to infinity, it sums up an infinite number of rewards in the future, um, we impose this discount factor gamma. So the discount factor is just a number between zero and one, and we apply it, um, we use it to impose an effective horizon onto the return by exponentially discounting our future rewards. What this does in effect is, yeah, as I say, it, impact, it imposes an effective horizon. So for instance, um, the horizon is of length like one over one minus gamma, and that's just a property of these geometric sums. And if gamma is 0.1, for instance, or sorry, 0.9, then the horizon is effectively of length 10. Even though we're summing an infinite number of terms, um, we're effectively adding the, the next 10. And if it's 0.99, then it's 100 and so on and so forth. So here, we, let's look at how the MDP formalism is used within a very common domain, um, the canonical grid world domain. So in reinforcement learning, this is uh, often a researcher's starting point when they have new ideas and they want to test them out. And that's because these are easy to implement um, and you can often implement them very efficiently and get results quickly. Uh, you also be ex you'll also be getting a little bit of experience with grid worlds in your practical assignment. So under the hood, uh, grid worlds are a set of fully observable states and there's a finite number of them. And here I'm representing that and denoting that with just a set from one to n for little n states. The actions that are available in grid worlds are just the four cardinal directions. So west, north, south, and east. Um, in this domain, we're starting off in this particular cell down here. And we're, we can move up. If we try and move left, or we try and move right, or we try and move down, then the default behavior is to usually impose a self-looping transition there where nothing happens at all. So the left action here would just leave you in the same state. Um, and that would apply you know, globally throughout this, this state space. Um, so 
determin or transitions within grid worlds can be both deterministic and stochastic. If they're deterministic, then the action that you choose always leads to the same outcome. So every time I go up in the starting state, I will always go up. Um, however, we can also impose stochastic uh, transitions within the grid world so that uh, perhaps we'll only go in the intended direction some percentage of the time. So what is the environment state within a grid world and what are the observations? What is the agent state typically? Um, at least within the way I implement grid worlds, the environment state is just an index. It's some integer value. Um, observations are, they can either be an integer value, the same thing as the environment state, uh, in which case the system would be fully observable, or it can be an alternative but equivalent representation that would still maintain a full observability. Uh, so for instance, it could be a one hot vector of the length equaling the total number of states. Um, and the index i, if the, if the environment is in state i at some time step, then the observation at that time step would be a one hot vector of length, you know, cardinality of s with the ith index equal to one and all of the others equal to zero. Um, but equivalently, we can capture all the same information if we have the right visualization of the grid world. So if I color this square black when the learning systems or the environment is in that state, then I can equivalently give that observation, that pixel grid, to the uh, learning system as well and learn with pixels. Um, however, I'll just point out that that's maybe less common and it's more common when you're operating in these grid worlds to just operate directly on one-hot vectors and indices. Um, a policy. This is a really central concept in reinforcement learning because this is the, this is the mathematical tool that allows uh, the learning system and to make decisions. Um, a policy describes the way of behaving, uh, and this, is a this applies to every given state. So mathematically, a policy is some stochastic mapping, meaning it can be either a distribution or a regular function, but it maps states to actions. Um, so if I'm in uh, this particular state here, then, it would, then this policy that I'm displaying would tell me to go right, go right, go right, if I'm here, go up, 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 and if I'm here, go left, so on and so forth. Um, it can sometimes be beneficial to use a stochastic policy, meaning flip a coin, and some percentage of the time I'll take one action, some percentage of the time I'll take another action. Um, that can be particularly useful in environments that either change or they're inherently stochastic too. Value functions. Um, so since the return is a random variable in the general setting, the learning system, in order to try and estimate the value of a policy, how good a policy is to follow, it will maintain what's called a value function. And the value function is just the expected value of the return. Um, there are two forms of the value function. We have the state value function here denoted v pi s. And what this denotes is the value, the expected value of the return being in state s and then following policy pi for all time steps afterwards. Um, so let's look at the grid here. Uh, this is one potential value function that we could maybe realize. And what it says is that if you're at the goal, then the value of being in that state is 44. And that's a pretty good thing. Now look at these two states, the two 41 states. These, are, these have an equivalent value under, this, under the same policy. So if you're here, um, that's equally good as being in this cell here too. Um, so yeah, the state value function we can think of as a prediction. It's predicting the utility of being in that state. Now we can also ask the question, what is the value of taking some action A in a given state and then following the policy pi for all the time steps that follow? Um, this is what we call the action value function, and it's, and it's typically denoted Q. Some people call it Q factor or the Q function, um, but it's just defined as the expected return conditioned on the starting state and the action that's taken in that state. And we can use this for uh, learning control policies uh, as well as evaluating them.
So in reinforcement learning, there's this constant tension between what actions you need to take in order to uh, achieve more reward and what actions you need to take in order to learn more about your environment. And this tension is referred to as the exploration versus exploitation dilemma. Um, and it really comes down to the observation that an action at any given time step affects the future performance of, of the learning system. And you know, if I asked you to navigate from Kathmandu to Janakpur, the actions you take early on near Kathmandu will affect you know, how quickly you get to Janakpur. Um, so again, if you, if you were courageous and you didn't have much information about how to get there, then you might do a lot of exploring. And that would you know, tell you something about uh, what actions you need to take in order to get there quicker. Um, and then there's the exploitation bit, which is, you know, once you have your knowledge, um, should you exploit what it is that you already know uh, so that you can be sure that your actions are immediately useful? So in reinforcement learning, one often represents either a value function or a policy within um, the learning system. And this kind of divides the kinds of learning algorithms that you'll see. Um, but there is also this uh, hybrid this hybrid architecture called the actor critic architecture. And these are systems that represent both a value and a policy, and they're both targets for learning. Um, in the policy based uh, set of algorithms, the policy is directly parameterized. There's no value function that's uh, maintained, and that's used as the learning target and for direct decision making. Um, in value based systems, you're learning the expected value of the return. And then you're using that value function to derive your policy. You want to take actions that would maximize the expected sum of your future returns, right? That maximize the value function in any given state. Um, and for actor critic methods, what you're typically doing is learning a value function to evaluate how good your policy is, but then you're going to update that policy directly and then follow that. And it's also important to point out that there's two modes that these RL algorithms operate within. There's the prediction mode in which the learning system is given a policy and that remains fixed and is trying to estimate, you know, what is the expected return that's induced by this policy? How good is this policy? And then there's the control setting, which is trying to adapt the policy um, so that it can learn useful decisions. Here's an example of prediction. Um, within a five by five grid world domain. This is going to be the same exact domain that you uh, encounter in your lab or your practical assignment. Here's the reward structure. So there are zeros everywhere, except for this cell here. And you can think of that as the goal. The learning system will start in the lower left-hand corner. And whenever it reaches the plus one, um, learning will terminate. And uh, the system will reset back to the starting point here. Um, so if the learning system just followed a random policy, it just took random actions at any given time, how good would that be? Um, but we can see that this is the effect of doing that. We can see that if you took random actions near the goal, then there's a good chance that you're uh, still going to experience that reward and that can be a good thing. Um, however, it's not very useful to take random actions far away from the goal. Right? Um, they're not too informative. Now, if we think about control and we ask the question, well, how do we uh, learn to take actions that maximize my sum of future rewards? Um, this is what the value function and the optimal policy imposed on top of it looks like. At least this is the policy that was obtained after uh, a finite number of iterations of an algorithm that you will implement and you will learn about next lecture. But just for uh, demonstration purposes, we can follow this policy through these arrows and we can see we'll start off in the lower left hand corner. We'll go up, we'll go up, we'll take a right, we'll go up and then go right, 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 and then finally up again to get to the goal. <clears throat> and we can see that the color is indicating uh, how valuable it is to be in that state and follow that policy. Um, and we can see that it's Red is one of the higher valued numbers, and then yellow and green are the lower valued numbers. Less valuable to be here, but it gets more valuable as we get closer to the goal. 
All right. So as we come to a close in the lecture, I think it's important to point out and to reflect on some common assumptions that are imposed within the RL framework. Uh, the first was that um, a scalar reward was sufficient, really, to describe all the goals that a learning system could meet. And there's kind of this presumption in AI that um, a scalar reward signal is going to be sufficient for a machine to achieve human level intelligence. We saw maybe in Atari that that was the case uh, within that very narrow you know, view of intelligence. Um, but it's worth at least recognizing and thinking for yourself about whether you agree with that. Um, I would be happy to talk about this further in the Discord channel. But for the moment, let's look at these other questions. So where do other agents fit into the picture of this reinforcement learning problem? Uh, the framework I presented so far was sort of egocentric in that it, there was no consideration of other learners within the environment. Um, the learning system just took observations in and used those to take actions. So in that sense, all other learners that are in the environment had no special treatment. They were just, they were just treated as perhaps like another observation. Um, Modern instantiations of reinforcement learning do consider multiple, um, multiple learners. Um, and it could be interesting to think about what the consequences or, yeah, what the consequences of that are and how exactly they would fit into it um, in another general setting. Uh, also, the environments that were presented here uh, were all assumed to be relatively fixed, right? There's always a reward that was received when the, the learning system entered the top right corner of that grid world, and that never changed. Um, and it, the learning system just gets to experience that indefinitely. And you know, through more and more experience, it will eventually take good, uh, make good decisions. Um, however, what about environments that persistently change? A lot of active area or a lot of active research right now is going into trying to design algorithms precisely for the setting. Um, this is called the continual reinforcement learning setting. And if you're interested more in this, I encourage you to Google and um, bring up the conversation in Discord. We can talk about it more. So um, that was your first glimpse into reinforcement learning. And you know, following this, you're going to learn about some of the essential algorithms within reinforcement learning. These are things like SARSA and Q learning and some other policy iteration methods. Um, and then we're going to show you in lecture three how to scale these up to larger scale function approximators um, with involving deep neural networks. And then in uh, lecture four, we'll spotlight some really interesting applications of reinforcement learning. So uh, thank you for your attention today, and I really hope you enjoyed the lecture. There's been some good discussion going on in the chat, and I think it would be productive if we... Um, just move that over over the voice channel. Um, so there was a question. Let me bring up the chat again. Lost it. There it is. Um, there's a question by Sujan. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, can you unmute and ask your question? Hello. Hi, John. This is Vises. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so we are in a hall and I think I will ask, I'll, I'll ask uh, participants to raise hands if they have questions and then uh, we, we, we can try to coordinate, let's see. So you can see the hall, can you? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's a bit dark perhaps, but... <laughs> No, okay. I, I can see people fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Any questions? Please raise your hands and yeah, well, there... like a... yeah. While we wait, perhaps you can answer if there are still questions that are unanswered in chat. Perhaps, yeah. Sure. So I'll take a swing uh, at uh, Sujan's question. Um, so a finite set of states can produce outputs, which is not in our and in turn, that produces reward, which will guide our future actions. Um, 
I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but I feel like it relates to the agent environment interaction. So maybe I will just reiterate what that interaction is. Um, at some given point in time, the agent can take an action. And these actions come from a finite set of actions, or it can come from an infinite set. But the point is, like, it comes from a fixed set. Um, so, for example, it can come from a set of left, up, right, down actions, like we saw in the grid world. Um, it could also come from a continuous variable, too. Um, say a number just between zero and one, where zero represented like no input and one represented like maximum throttle if maybe you're uh, riding a motorbike or something. Um, so from those actions, uh, we'll take that and apply that in the environment. And that causes a transition in the environment, right? It causes a change. And um, as a result of that change, the environment will transition to another state and it'll output the next re reward and the next observation um, that the learning system gets to take in. Um, and that kind of reconnects the learning system to the environment. And then the whole cycle starts over again. Um, so I hope that maybe clarified the confusion there. And if not, feel free to chime in and ask again. Um, Nira John, so for example, in something like a board game, does the environment state comprise of the rules implemented through code? Yeah, this is a good question. So let's think about this. Yeah, in chess, um, there are maybe just a few rules, right? The rules would kind of govern the dynamics of, of the game. And I think the rules would serve the role as like the dynamics, maybe rather than the state but the rules tell you how the state of the board evolves. So maybe the state um, in chess would be the location of all the pieces and maybe some other information telling you whether the piece was active, like whether it was on the board or not. Um, you are, uh, yeah, I, he has one question from the hall. So please, can you ask your question? Yeah. First, Hello. So name your a question regarding you know, the difference between value-based and policy-based reinforcement learning. So, because in policy-based, you know, whenever we're in a certain state, you know, you know, the usefulness or you know the importance of that state is defined by you know the value that or the reward that will get in the future. So, how they are different, you know, the value-based and policy-based RL. It's a good question. It, it has to do with what the target of learning is. In uh, value-based um, algorithms, the value function is the target of learning, meaning that's the, that's the thing that's being represented and that's the thing that the, uh, the learning system is updating. Um, that's where the knowledge is. And I would say you can use a value function to define a way of uh, taking actions, right? You might wanna take actions to maximize your value. Um, but you can learn a value and then use your value function to do that. So in a sense, like the value being the learning target, it serves as the intermediate uh, between the learning system and its, and its decisions. Um, in the policy-based setting, we aren't using the value function as an intermediate. We're directly using the policy as the, the target of learning. Um, so we would update, let's say, I feel like it might be more clear with an example. Um, say a policy is a mapping from states to actions. And in these grid world domains, um, we can say have a table where for every state, um, we just save a number and the number would be what action do I take in the state? Uh, so that would be an example of a policy-based method where we would update a table like that um, because we're just following that particular policy. Uh, does that make it a little more clear? Yes. Yeah, so I think maybe to Another summarize. From Hall? Yeah, Sorry. you? Okay, is, is that one with the cap? Are you going to ask? No, okay, you have a mic. Anyone else? Questions in the hall? Yeah, there's one question here on the left. Please, yeah, what's your name? And then you can ask a question. Hello? 
Hello, I'm Sukriya. So my question was about uh, multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning, like in the game of hide and seek by OpenAI. How does uh, how can two agents uh, train independently? Like, won't action of one affect another? So how can they learn in an independent way so that it will optimize the performance or something? How will that work, multi-agent system? Yeah, multi-agent systems are difficult for the exact reason you described. And so um, maybe I can't answer your question, I feel like, entirely. But what I can do is I can give you a sense of what that looks like from one agent's perspective. And I can give you a sense of what a good thing might be to do from that single agent's perspective, right? So when there are multiple agents in the world, as you say, they're both taking actions and they're both changing the environment. And so to one agent, what that looks like is that the environment that it knows is changing. And if that one agent wasn't there, then the environment would be more or less, I don't want to call it predictable, or, but it would be stationary in mathematical terms. Um, so you'd be able to experience it uh, kind of consistently over and over again. Whereas when there's another agent in there, it's non-stationary. And so things are changing. And so it becomes beneficial in those uh, cases for each particular agent, if they're not going to be able to have any information about the other learners, like if they don't know that another learner is acting and how they're acting, so they can't incorporate that information into how they act, then the best thing they can do is to try and track well, that's what it's called. Um, meaning like I can just try and learn as fast as possible um, so that I can beat the non-stationarity, if that makes sense. Um, yes, yes it does, thank you. Another question here in the front, in the middle, middle. Middle row, uh, sorry, middle column. Yeah. Hello. Hey, uh, my name is Narba, and my question was regarding value based uh, reinforce, reinforcement learning and policy based. Um, it seems like the complexity and the, I don't know, processing would be the same in value based. We're just doing most of the legwork up front and then using it later on, whereas in policy based, we're just doing the whole thing like like this, most of the competition, like like diving head, head first into that. Uh, do you think there's like differences in outcome or performance in either, in either of two? And if there is, then in what situations are value-based optimizations better than policy-based? Yeah, those are all good questions. So I'll try and answer two of those questions. Um, Maybe the first one I'll answer might touch on the second one. Uh, the, when are uh, when would you use one or the other? And I think folks would agree that it's maybe easier to use policy-based algorithms when you're dealing with uh, continuous actions, um, and when you're dealing with stochastic policies, and that's because. Um, we can represent we can represent distributions over those single numbers pretty easily, and um, and yeah, it's easier to do it with just a policy in that case than it would be to learn a value function over many many different actions. Um, value based methods. When are value based methods good? Well, I think value based methods have a lot of. I guess I don't want to call it theoretical support because they both have a lot of theoretical support. Um, but value-based methods give you predictions. Like they give you, they give you knowledge that you can apply in other places too, right? Because the value is telling you what is the expected reward sometime into the future. Um, whereas the policy is just giving you something reactive. It's telling you what to do at a given point. And so maybe that information is less transferable. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that was the best answer for you, but uh, one thing I'll say is that, yeah, policy-based methods tend to be used a lot in robotic settings and in settings that require continuous actions. Um, and when they're both combined in these actor-critic algorithms, you tend to do really well, too. Did I answer that sufficiently for you? Yeah, yeah, that was good. Thank you. Okay, next question. In the hall, anyone? Okay, there's one in the back, uh, left, yeah, near the window. Yeah. Hello. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, we remember the movie I Robot, where you know the robot decided that killing the weakest uh, sort of ten percent humans would create a global optimum, right? So uh, <laughs> we don't want to kill people, but uh, how how does that kind of an ethical situation or uh, say a strong policy where you know uh, we want the algorithm wants a global optimum, but you know the path is not right, sort of. How does Path that? Is not right. Yeah. Can you can you expand? We know that we'll get to a global optimum. For example, we, you know, say uh, a robot decides that let's kill all cancer patients or stuff like that. I see. I see. I think I understand what you're trying to say. You're asking, um, how do we impose some preferences on the solution path? Perhaps, um, like if we care about the way that the system is learning. Um, yeah, how do we, how would we deal with that within the RL uh, setting? Well, what I can say is that's a, that's a big open question, I think, that a lot of people are researching. And you can think about that question from a few different perspectives. Uh, one would be maybe a safety and uh, robust RL perspective where if you have a robot, you don't want it to, you know, run people over, or you don't want it to like, you don't want to uh, destroy expensive equipment. Having it try a bunch of actions that might be available, but maybe aren't very useful. Um, and so I think people are asking, how can you explore safely? Uh, one way to do that, I think, is through prior information. Um, another way to do that is by us a judicious selection of the algorithm. Um, there are, I think you'll learn about this in the next lecture, uh, but there are what call, what's called on-policy algorithms and off-policy algorithms, meaning you can learn about different ways of acting without having to you know, act that way. Uh, like I can follow a policy and I can learn about a decision policy without having to actually like uh, try those decisions out, if that makes sense. And what this opens up is the possibility to learn about many different things without having to experience them. Um, and I think that's one possible avenue to at least like impose preferences on the path because you could say uh, require that the system follow a policy whose behavior was acceptable um, and then learn about something else which would be a little riskier uh, but without having to directly experience that riskiness. That answer your question, Bona? Thanks. I see that there are a few other uh, follow-up questions in the chat too that I haven't been able to address. Um, what's the difference between rewarding and penalizing the agent? Um, mathematically, I would say none. It's well, mathematically, maybe it's just a difference in sign, but um, the concept remains the same. You, that information would be encoded in the reward, um, and we would call a bonus anything that was greater than zero. If the, the reward was plus one, then it would be a bonus. If the reward was minus one, then it would be a penalty. Um, yeah, so that's what I'll say there. In a game like chess, would you prefer value-based method rather than a policy-based? Good question. Um, I can't see any good reason. So there's another thing I will say about policy-based methods is often people use them when you need to learn stochastic policies. And the way that that's done is typically very noisy. Um, what I mean by that is the performance of the system will vary quite a bit when using these, uh, when using value-based methods. And there's been a lot of open research into how do you reduce, how do you deal with the bias variance trade-off and reduce the variance uh, in these policy gradient methods, these policy optimization methods. Um, so if you care about that, then you might want to use a value-based method. Um, and in a game like chess, I think I'm a value-based person. At least that's like how that's how my gut always uh, tells me to go. 
Um, so I would go with a value-based method in chess. Uh, one, because I think you could be able to interpret the results too. You would be able to say like, look at the value function and it would tell you that this was a good position because of this value is good rather than just like take this action in this given state. Um, can you elaborate about the temporal effect of delayed transitions? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand if there's an importance I should be placing on the term delayed transitions. Um, yeah, because perhaps what, perhaps the question is asking, can we think about transitions that aren't instantaneous? Because I think the way I've described the whole transition process so far, the learning system takes an action and then it immediately sees, um, and then the, the, yeah, the environment immediately transitions to a next state and you see uh, an observation. So what if there were maybe um, temporal delays in there um, where you couldn't realize um, the reward or some reward until like some time steps later or something like that. Um, I guess what I would say is you can always, I'm not sure if that's, if that would really be realizable in the MDP setting because something is always happening. So during the process in which perhaps like a delay is occurring on one scale, things are still evolving. And it's really like that evolution, which I think the MDP is capturing like the step-by-step -step evolution. And maybe this top level process could be captured by a different MDP. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't know if I did the best job answering that question. So I would encourage uh, Srijan to uh, ask it again in the Discord or something, and maybe I can try and follow up a little bit better. Kieran, in some cases, it can be difficult to define rewards, or there can be many ways to define rewards. What are the ways to find the best reward for the agent that is interacting with the environment? Yeah, so where do rewards come from? I think that's a really fundamental question. Um, there are many schools of thought on this, and I don't think I could really do justice to the whole landscape, but I'll give you a sense of how I think about defining rewards. And I'll give you a sense of maybe how others that are interested in different things uh, would add, address this question. Um, so I am interested in algorithms that are very general purpose. And so I wanna give them as le a little information as possible. And the reason for doing that isn't to make the problem artificially difficult so much as it is um, to know that the algorithm is generally applicable. Um, when you give an algorithm less information, it can apply when there's less information available in more settings. Whereas if you give it more information than, and it relies on that, then it can only apply in that narrow, that more narrow context. Um, and so in that sense, I would, I usually define rewards in what's called maybe the sparse reward sense where uh, every transition gets a zero except for the transitions into some desired state, uh, for example. So in the grid world setting, the learning system got a zero for transitioning everywhere in the grid world, except once a transition to the desired cell, it got a one. Um, I typically consider those kinds of problems. Now, other folks in engineering um, that are interested in things like imitation learning, what they'll do is use the reward as the target, really, the learning target, and apply ideas from supervised learning to take a bunch of demonstrations of things that they would consider good um, and desirable. And from that, try and back out what the reward function would be. And so what that allows those people to do is take a small subset of um, ex examples and experiences, pull out a reward that might fit those experiences well, and then they can um, impose that on a reinforcement learning system to say, learn better things that would generalize um, within the spaces that they care about. So I would say uh, a lot of engineering applications focus on that 
on that uh, setting. Um, as you mentioned, in animal behavior, the nervous, the nervous system is signaling first reality. So what does the reality refer to? Well, I feel like this is where things are getting like a little philosophical because like what is the agent state of reality or what is the environment state of reality, right? Um, I think like if we want to assume that um, things are computable, right? we're doing all of this in computers, um, then it's really anything, all the information that you would need to simulate the relevant aspects of the world. So the reality part of all that is like, maybe I should be less abstract. Uh, in the, um, this was the question about animal behavior. So maybe in like the, in the maze example, um, there's an animal in there and it's making decisions based on its sensory input right, which is driven by the physical uh, phenomena occurring within the maze. Um, so if it can smell the cheese when it gets closer to it, then all the physical phenomena that goes into giving cheese smell <laughs> and having that smell propagate to, to the animal and having the animal be able to interpret those primitive like sensory inputs and then put it into a useful pattern that it can then like detect and say like, oh, this is the cheese pattern. I think uh, I'm gonna, now that my cheese pattern detector is stronger right now, I can, I'm gonna take more actions this way. Uh, that's all I'll sign credit. Um, so the reality there is really referring to all the phys physical phenomena that are relevant to, I would say, forward simulating the environment at that point, uh, giving like forward simulating reality from the animal's perspective from that point. Um, hopefully that, that response helped. What is the difference between model-based and policy-based in reinforcement learning? Yeah, this is a good question too. Uh, it's something I would have liked to cover, but I think um, Abby Sheck is gonna cover this in the next lecture. I can give you a sneak peek. Um, all the methods that I've spoken about so far have been, well, I didn't give you any algorithms, um, but maybe I've been describing the model-free case and this is the case where the learning system doesn't have knowledge of how the environment transitions. It doesn't have that transition distribution P that goes into the Markov decision process definition. Um, and so what that means is if it doesn't have a model of the way that the world evolves, then all it can do is try something out and, and then uh, like observe the effects of that. Um, so the model-based methods uh, refer to algorithms where they are either given a model of the environment and um, they use that to, say, perform internal simulations to update the value function or the policy. Um, or they refer to situations where the, the algorithm starts with some family of models um, and it has to learn the model as it goes. So it makes transitions in the environment. And then it says, well, I'm transitioning this way. I'm gonna put that in, I'm gonna learn a model typically through like supervised learning. Um, and then I'm gonna use that model to forward simulate what I think the world is like, and then use that simulated experience, that internal experience to update my policy or my value function. So that's a that's, uh, model-based. And you can have a model-based algorithm um, and form a policy-based algorithm. Um, the policy value-based dichotomy is referring to what the learning target is, whereas the model-based dichotomy is referring to what prior information is the, the learning system given and um, how is it updating either the policy or the value function. Can I elaborate on the discount factor? Um, Sure. So I guess I'll just reiterate, I guess, how it's applied. Um, let me let me just share my screen with the lecture slides again. Let me find the slide with the discounted methods. Okay.
All right. So the discount factor is something we use to impose an effectively finite horizon on an infinite sum. So here, the discount factor is gamma. It's some number between zero and one. And what it, we're doing with it is we're applying it um, multiplicatively to future rewards. So here, we'll discount the, not the next reward, but the reward after that. And then we'll doubly discount the following and uh, triply discount the next one and so on and so forth. Um, so if I were to write this as a sum, which perhaps I should have, it would just be the sum of these Rs gamma to the time step T. And we're just exponentially discounting the future rewards. And so in effect, what's that, what that's doing is it's narrowing the, the range of experience that the learning system is, is really giving priority to. Um, and the example I gave in the chat is that um, if we're hungry, then our effective horizon, like the, we're discounting, we would discount experiences very far into the future if we're really hungry and our objective is to try and find food, right? Because I don't care what's going to happen next year. I don't care what's going to happen tomorrow. Really what I care about is like, how can I find food like right now or within the next 15 minutes or the next hour or something like that. Um, Whereas if you're thinking about, well, what sort of job do I want? Um, or what sort of uh, things should I be learning? Uh, should I be learning supervised learning or reinforcement learning so that I can get a job later or so that I can solve some really interesting scientific problem? Um, that might be a longer horizon uh, sort of discounting process where you are considering more steps into the future. Uh, it just depends on how like with what temporal horizon you want to assign credit to your actions with. All right, well, that's all the questions from the chat. Is there anything else from the audience? Any questions from the audience? Okay, since there's none, Oh, okay, there's one. Hello, uh, my name is Dinesh Gamosu. I have just one query for you. Uh, in real life, in real life problems domains, there can be many actions. Uh, does the actions so for the optimum performance uh, solution, we have to optimize the action. Uh, my question is that does the reinforcement learning itself optimize the action or we have to integrate uh, those with the other optimization algorithm? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Uh, is the question like what is the optimization problem in RL? Uh, I mean that in real problem there can be many actions. Yeah, just about 20, 30 actions. So my query is that, uh, does Rene for RL itself optimize the minimum actions or does uh, do we have to integrate with other algorithm, mid optimization algorithm for the optimizations? And that's a really, that's a really interesting question. I don't think I've ever thought of that, that before. Um, I would say the short answer is no. Um, the typical reinforcement learning setting is uh, considers just a fixed number of actions. So if there are 20 actions that you care about um, in your problem, then you would consider all 20 and you would evaluate all 20, at least at every given state, um, you would be able to at least. Um, but I've never seen work, at least I'm not familiar with any work, that starts with like say a large set of actions and then dwindles that down to uh, the minimum necessary set of actions. Um, that seems really interesting though. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, one more. Hello. So my question is, you know, you said uh, in the reinforcement learning, we generally have, you know, a small set of actions, right? 
but uh, if you're trying to solve real world problems then you know there are like infinite number of like variations and actions and you said before you know in your slide that we use you know one odd vector for you know classifying you know different for giving the model you know different kinds of tasks so could you use something like you know word embeddings from nlp you know to you know just give the model you know like a, a, a complex type of semantic representation of actions yeah i think the question you're getting is what happens when the number of actions gets bigger right or the number of states get bigger um this is the first lecture so i presented you with i would say like the the conceptually simplest form which of course is not the form that you would use in these larger scale systems um i don't know if i can give you a satisfactory answer now but all i'll say is i think we'll address that concern in lecture 3 because in lecture 3 we're going to be looking at larger scale systems and these are systems that have to use function approximation things like embeddings um to to handle large dimensional observations when there's a ton of states like what perhaps your state is continuous um perhaps the action is continuous and so in those cases these one hot vectors um become intractable and so yeah your concerns will be will be addressed hopefully uh in lecture 3 any other questions no more questions are there any remaining in chat i don't see any yeah. no, so okay. so i think we can move towards wrapping up this session thank you uh, john for this fantastic lecture and a great uh, q and a session thank you everyone and see you later yeah see you okay thank you bye